One of the questions that we've gotten asked a lot over the last year is, how is Reflectone doing? They're now called BAE Systems, Simulation and Flight Training Business Unit. And we thought that we'd bring you back in time to take you through kind of where they've come with and where they are today, two years into implementing multi-project management. We have with us today um, the president of the company, John Pitts. John has been president of BAE Systems Simulation and Flight Training since 1998 and been with the company since 1997. He brings a vast array of experience from Harris, General Electric, and Systems Research Laboratories to this position. Also presenting today is Bob Mendenhall, who is director of integrated scheduling at BAE Systems and head of our implementation team there. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce BAE Systems. The question, how to meet the expectations of customers whose future is in the skies? The answer, deliver value that fulfills all expectations. Then, go beyond. BAE Systems is a company formed through the merger of British Aerospace and Marconi Electronic Systems. We're a company focused on performing beyond expectations, beyond some of the highest expectations in the world. Our business unit is called Flight Simulation and Training, and that describes our business perfectly. You may know us better as Reflectone, an organization that's been pioneering simulation and training for more than 60 years. We've adopted a single corporate identity throughout BAE Systems. We are now the world's second largest defense contractor and third largest aerospace company. As BAE Systems, we have unmatched skills and capabilities to manage the most complex programs. One of our core capabilities is delivering total training solutions led by the former Reflectone unit now called Flight Simulation and Training. At Flight Simulation and Training, we focus our efforts on three lines of business, products, training services, and training centers. Specifically, we make some of the world's most advanced simulators and training devices for both fixed wing and rotary wing aircraft. Aircraft such as the C-130 Hercules, E-2C Hawkeye, F-A-18 Super Hornet, A-H-1 Cobra, U-H-60 Blackhawk, Airbus A-320, and many others. We're proud to be recognized as a world leader in providing C-130 training solutions. We're proud of our pioneering developments in areas such as reconfigurable trainers and helmet-mounted displays. But our business goes well beyond the manufacture of simulator products. We provide sophisticated, cost-effective training support services, such as providing flight simulation instruction and simulator maintenance for the U.S. Navy. We are one of the world leaders in providing contractor training services at customer facilities. We also design, build, and operate flight training centers worldwide. Our C-130 training center in Tampa trains more than 2,000 each year. And we expect to grow our training center business by establishing strategic partnerships with leading companies. We do all this by going beyond our customers' expectations. Five core values drive the way BAE Systems does business. Customers, our highest priority. People, our greatest asset. Innovation and technology, our competitive edge. Partnering, our future. Performance, our key to winning. Well, good morning to you, and thank you for, uh, for joining us here this morning. We're pretty pleased to be here. One, to uh, share with you some of our trials, tribulations, and successes in implementing critical chain management and also to, to brag a little bit because we're pretty proud of, of what we've been able to accomplish so far. To do that, uh, I, should, I should put this in perspective. We'll share a little history. We'll look forward a little bit. 
But at the end of our session here, uh, I would like you to understand, we will have failed if you don't understand, that this began as uh, almost as an act of desperation. We had a business that was in trouble and we had to fix it. And so it began under a, one set of circumstances. And it has evolved to a real market positioning issue, a real bona fide strategic issue with regard to our product's business. And as a result, we feel that we're in just a whole lot better position uh, confronting a marketplace that we do right now. That's a real message I'd like to, to share with you. It has exceeded my expectations. Perhaps those were too modest initially, but uh, we're, we're pretty proud of where we have ended up. But let's think about that history, and I need to go back a long ways, if I may. 30 years ago, this summer, I was a, uh, <clears throat> I was a cadet uh, leading a uh, company of folks on summer maneuvers, a little, uh, little place called Camp Buckner outside of West Point, New York. And we were preparing for a night attack, and this old colonel took me aside. I thought he was old then. Today I recognize that he was a young, vibrant young man. <laughs> so this, this vibrant young colonel took me aside and poked his finger in my chest, and he said, Pitts, never go somewhere you haven't been before. Sir? Now, I'd been, some years prior to that, I'd been taught three responses, yes, sir, no, sir, and no excuse, sir. At this point in time, I'd had time to learn that if there was a fourth response, which I then offered, sir, I do not understand. So he proceeded to explain to me about never going someplace you haven't been before. You've got to do your homework. You have to rehearse. Do an aerial reconnaissance. Go do a ground reconnaissance. If all else fails, you lack the time, the resources, do a thorough map reconnaissance. Put together your plan and practice it. Rehearse it with your troops. Never go someplace you haven't been before. A year and a half ago, conference room in Reflectone, now flight simulation and training. We were some six, eight months into our theory of constraints, critical chain management initiative, if you will. We were looking at a program that had been a real challenge for us, building A320 simulators, you saw some pictures of some Airbus aircraft in this video. A320 simulators for Airbus. It was this particular customer who some six months earlier, when I was two months in my, in my seat as CEO, came in and said, you guys are going to miss a schedule. Whereas our own team let on no such thing. So my customer was saying we were going to miss schedule. He proved to be correct, of course. At this point, six months in, towards the tail end of 1998, we had put together our first networks, we had done our calculations, and were showing that we'd have a product ready in the summer of 1999, which, by the way, we subsequently met. That notwithstanding, as we, at the end of 1998 here, some, some, some of the bright guys on this team, and there are a lot of bright people in that company, but folks who had been in this industry for a long time, suggested, hey, if we had this one piece of hardware from the customer, uh, or from their, their colleagues at Aerospatial. If we had this piece of hardware, we could work around here, and we could work around there, and we can probably shave three months off this schedule. Now, that had a good ring to it, because we were confronting liquidated damages for late delivery. Uh, and it sure would be nice to make this customer feel better after all that we had put him through. As we considered this, however, in the back of my little brain, the words of that vibrant young colonel echoed, Pitts, never go someplace you haven't been before. And so we called one of, one of Bob's folks down. Uh, he came down and we, we shared this, this problem with him. And we said, what if we had this piece of hardware and did this kind of a workaround? And he ran off to do what, what, they, he, what he called an excursion. It was, it was a what if exercise. And he was back 20 minutes later. Took him so long because it was probably 10 minutes to his desk and back to that conference room. In 20 minutes, he came back and he walked in and he said, yep, we can improve the schedule by one or two days if we do this. Whoa. You see, sitting right behind that particular set of tasks that we thought we could, could save the day was another uh, chain of events that was constrained by some things we just couldn't affect in the short term. Uh, and so the message is that we had done our reconnaissance. And back in those military terms, what happened was 
by doing that homework, by going someplace we hadn't been before, we avoided an ambush where we would have sorely disappointed that customer. And as happens in ambushes, people die. In this business setting, it would have been a program manager and me. So we had some early successes, and that has motivated us to keep going. What we'll share with you today is, is some of the things that we have learned in the, in the course of this. And towards the end of the presentation, I'll try and, and spend some more time with you in terms of how this has helped us in positioning ourselves in the marketplace. But have no doubt, this is, from me today, a testimonial. This has really helped us. And if it can help you as much, I certainly recommend it to you, unless you happen to be one of my direct competitors. Bob? Uh, I want to uh, start off by saying um, I am an engineer by training, by choice, and as a result of that, when I first began to look at this at TOC, after I got through the goal, after I got through critical chain, uh, I began to recognize that this was a control system. My background is, is uh, control systems and dynamics. I've been in product development for 25 years, and I thought, this could work, this could work. And I'm I would like to say to you that not only does it work, but it's taken us to a new level, a level we didn't think we could achieve before. And we're ready to go to that next level and keep going. John Pitts, uh, this is a quote for, from John in the Armed Forces Journal. It very succinctly says we want to be honest about what we can and can't do. At the time, that we started this off, the question was, how do we go about doing it? Our starting place are these up here. Uh, John made some reference to that. We were expanding our resources so rapidly to try to, to meet the demand that we were having difficulties. We were struggling with our schedule commitments. Uh, we had grown pretty rapidly over a, over a two-year period. We weren't satisfying customer requirements completely. Content was in jeopardy towards the ends of programs. We really didn't have the data to tell us what we needed to do in order to make management decisions. And there were several contracts that we just weren't going to make money on. In addition, and I'm sure you've experienced this, there was not the integration and communication between our functions. Before we start here, uh, this was John's testimonial, but what you're going to hear are from, throughout this presentation are pre, uh, testimonials from individuals who were not, at the outset of this, completely convinced this was the right direction. And what you're going to hear are how that change has been so beneficial to our company. I think one of the issues facing us when we first began our implementation of theory of constraints was understanding where we were in all of our programs in a consistent manner. Very much it was the function of how good was the program manager and the program team in presenting this information and actually knowing where they were, a lot of it inferential, gut feel, or rather than a calculated, uh, very disciplined approach that left no argument as to exactly where you were and where you would be if you did not take different action. Since we've implemented TOC, and it's not been all easy, uh, we have gotten to a position now where we have a predicted finish date for each program and can estimate when key events will occur. It requires discipline. It requires people understanding how their program uh, unfolds as it goes along. Uh, it requires a lot of checks and balances. People making sure that other people are presenting accurate and complete information and responding to the day-to-day -day challenges and changes in a program schedule because our programs are very dynamic. By laying out the detailed relationship, the tasks, step by step, that 
the different groups go through in order to complete their part of the product, we have been able to challenge a lot of the old assumptions as to how you do your work, how you do your job. This has helped us eliminate things that we didn't need to do. Redundant steps, inefficient steps, understand where the log jams were in our processes, and has been an unexpected side effect, very beneficial to delivering our programs on time and saving money. But we now have today something that we can look at, show our customer, and say, this is where we are going to be. It's based upon not just a single program manager's opinion, but how this program uh, will unfold considering all of the influences of all of the other programs that we must support and staff within our organization. So as we began to look at what we needed, we began to recognize we needed information. I have been with, Re with Reflectone or BAE Systems since uh, 1984, and I've gone through several changes in management. As a, as a result of uh, being bought and sold and changes in the marketplace. And as a result of that, also see middle management changes and people changes. As a result of that, we lost some knowledge. We lost some knowledge in terms of processes. And it became, to, it became very apparent when we had grown to this level that we were struggling under the weight of all of this workload. So we needed to understand what processes needed to be put in place, and as a result of that, what behaviors now needed to be um, identified and dealt with, mainly because programs were operating in a, in a isolated mode. We were, each program was being conducted by a program manager or a program team. Many times the people who were involved in that were also setting up their own processes in order to try to succeed in the middle of this chaos. So we needed to modify those behaviors. The first thing we needed in terms of information were visibility. We needed to understand what our re that our, we had enough resources during peak loading periods. We needed uh, project status versus our commitments. And we needed to uh, be able to know what our capacity is in order to take on more work. So in order to have the visibility, we needed an information system, and we needed the right database that would allow us to do planning, scheduling, and within that scheduling, setting priorities that were consistent with processes and behaviors we wanted to achieve. But we also needed, and this was a first for us, we needed synchronization. We needed to know what we needed to do first and what program needed to, be, needed to wait until we could get the right loading. In terms of resources, information on resources, we needed consistent task and budget planning. In other words, identify the right skills. Understand the difference between skill, performance, and experience. Now, I'm sure all of you have, have gone through some of this uh, on programs where you don't have the, the order in place, where there's chaos, you look for that guy, and his name is Biff, who can do it all. And the guy who does it all also is the guy who does the heroics. Now, you tend to burn those kind of people out, too. But you're not so interested in, in Lumpy. Lumpy's got a few skills, and they're good skills within his work, work skills, uh, but he can't do it all. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean to a program? If I've got Biff on the program, and I've got two tasks, let's say this is, he's working on the red tasks, we've got him in there for all those red tasks, but there's two tasks that I really don't need his skills for. I could use some lower level people. What it causes is for us to do some decontending of tasks in order for him to get them done, but if I can identify those tasks that could be used by lower level resources, or less experience, then I don't have to have contention, or I don't have to worry about contention between tasks. I can have another individual work on those tasks, and those are the blue tasks that were originally the red tasks. 
Uh, this is a trade-off where more tasks can demand general skills, more tasks for a resource can demand general skills within a discipline, and fewer tasks demanding the higher skills. Along with that, those information needs for resources, we also needed to account for variability in the planning stage. And we do this with a project planning tool using network building, logical description of project tasks that are required for, just for throughput, in our case, and their interdependencies. So in getting to project scheduling, we utilize the placement of safety in appropriate places to allow us to uh, determine where, where our paths should start and end. Now here's, a, here's an example of tasks that we have. All the safety's been removed. And we want to place that safety and aggregate it at the end of the project, before the due date, to protect it, and at integration points along the, the longest path in order to protect uh, variability along the shorter paths and how they join into the critical chain. Plans, budgets, and schedules, they really are only as good as the people who are following them. If, you, if we haven't put the processes in place or they understand what the exit criteria is to get to the next task, and if they don't realize the importance of updating tasks, keeping it, uh, keeping it current, your schedule is only as good as the day you created it. And so it is an important cultural change to modify those behaviors that said you have to understand what it means for us to, to have accurate uh, statusing. We're going to take a look at um, a video from our senior director and what it means for the functional areas to be living in this kind of environment. As head of engineering, um, one of the most important things for our company, uh, for me in engineering and also for the company, is uh, engineering resources and the effective utilization of those resources. Uh, this company is truly an engineering company, although we produce products and we manufacture things, we really are an engineering company. Uh, the bulk of our work probably up to 70% of our work on almost every program, or at least our budget, is engineering. So, you know, the success or failure of engineering is extremely important to this company. Uh, also, in today's labor market, it's very tight. Uh, and we have difficulty finding engineering resources, and uh, it's not always easy, you know, hiring engineers. So, we have, uh, we're basically in a situation where we have programs to run, we, uh, we have a lot of work to do, and we have basically more or less a fixed engineering resource base. Uh, in, the, in the past, before we got into the TOC uh, culture, uh, critical chain management, we had uh, pretty much a, a large amount of multitasking in the engineering community. Uh, we had many program managers demanding an engineer to do this, do that, do this, do that, and so we had a lot of people switching assignments. And as a result, having to go through different learning curves as they changed assignments and, and a lack of continuity on things. We also had... Um, um, people overtasked, where um, maybe they couldn't spend their full day thinking about a particular problem and they were um, jumping from task to task uh, because of the environment we were in. Uh, under the TOC methodology, we have a much more controlled environment where the multitasking, part of the philosophy is multitasking is kept to a minimum. We try to minimize it. We try to schedule our resources so that we don't have con conflicts between tasks that a task gets given to an engineer and runs to completion before they're assigned another task. And the scheduling vehicle uh, tries to help us do that. So as a result of that, um, we have a task availability report that comes out. And uh, is the resource manager's key on what needs to be done in their particular area? And the task availability report allows a resource manager to make those decisions about what tasks need to be worked on and what kind of resources should be assigned to it. And the, the idea is to minimize the multitasking. There's been many studies that have shown that uh, multitasking uh, reduces people's efficiency. And uh, since our environment, we have a constrained engineering resource, which is, and we have a critical amount of work in engineering to be done, it's very important we get efficiency out of the organization, out of the engineering organization. And we do that uh, through this uh, CCM system. The uh, task availability report is key to that, 
It is uh, the resource manager's tool in managing his area, uh, managing the tasks that need to be completed. So this is uh, uh, not only a program management scheme, but a very important scheme for helping us to run the company, uh, both from a program management point of view and an engineering point of view. The, uh, the resource managers uh, uh, get a report basically on their computer. We call a task availability report. All the tasks that are key, to, uh, that are in the window, we call it, uh, uh, on a program show up on that report. A task being in the window means it's a task that, that, that should be completed within a designated amount of time, which was part of the plan, and uh, is important to be completed in a sequence uh, determined by our priority scheme in the system. So he uses that report, he or she uses that report to make those judgments, to make those assignments, and to um, hand out work, basically. A good example of how the critical change management has helped us uh, manage and understand what's happening to us uh, in the company is uh, a program, uh, an F-18 program that we have right now. We had many problems with that program as the program unfolded. Uh, many of the commitments for uh, vendor equipment that were supposed to be delivered to us uh, were, not, were not possible, did not meet the committed dates. Um, one of the vendors for the uh, cockpit displays, one of the key cockpit displays, went out of business, basically closed his doors, and no longer could deliver those displays to us. So we had a major problem where we had a key piece of the trainer not being available, and we knew that it wasn't available. But in the past, we wouldn't have known what is the real impact to us on the program. Uh, we had to find alternate sources for that glass. We had to find alternate sources for the displays. Uh, but because we had a critical chain uh, schedule uh, put in place at the beginning of the program, we were able to look at the milestones that were key in the deliveries of those equipments. And we could move them to our new commitment dates and predict the outcome on the program, predict the effects of this happening to us. And as a result of that prediction, uh, back then we had a delivery commitment around the end of the year, uh, last year, 99, and uh, the critical chain schedule told us that, no, it's going to be June 2000. And sure enough, we are here in the middle of May. We just had customer, the pilots come in, love the trainer, which is good news for us, and we're getting ready to tear it down and deliver it in June, as predicted last year. So to me, that is a key uh, power in predicting the uh, performance of the company and a very powerful tool. Uh, in the past we would have had to guess. We wouldn't have been able to assess the impact of that delivery or lack of delivery on not only that program but all the other programs because as soon as one program slides out it starts affecting resources, start affecting our delivery, our abil ability to deliver other programs and, uh, and really uh, is a very important decision for the company. Not only uh, for us, but you look at the customer's point of view, the Navy is counting on training at a particular day on these trainers. Uh, any customer we sell a trainer to is, has, has something in mind for when they're going to receive it. So the, the fact that we were able to tell them, you know, probably eight to nine months that we would have this kind of problem and give them a very good prediction of when the trainer would be available allowed them to make their plans for their training such that it wouldn't be a problem for them. And when you can do that, everybody's happy. So within the process needs, how do we manage that? We had to learn to go from being silos of functional processes to uh, integration of functional processes. Uh, and this is the first time for, for me, being from the engineering environment, that I really began to understand what an internal customer is. Uh, Steve was talking very clearly about some things that are associated with his main internal customer is manufacturing. And the main inter internal customer for manufacturing happens to be the integration process. Systems software engineering, their, co their uh, customer happens to be the test phase because we do a handoff to test. And that's when these schedules, once you get a network like that, makes it very clear who your internal customer is and what you need to do in order to satisfy their needs, to meet schedules. The organization also has to move from prioritizing and expediting uh, to decisions that are based on the information that we give. And it has to have, be a, from a consistent set of pro control parameters, both in terms of content, time, and dollars. Uh, we were 
we were used to expediting big time, prioritizing programs. As soon as one program looked like it was in, in some degree of trouble, we would prioritize. We would even move resources over there to try to get it out of trouble. Constantly pulling work in. As soon as a program came on as far as a contract award, we wanted to start doing work right away. Along with the process needs, what has to happen for us is uh, policy and procedure changes. They had to harmonize. When we started, before we started, and one of the reasons that we began to look for something that would help us integrate and synchronize our resources is that we had gone through an audit a year before, and that audit had indicated that we needed to do something with program management, that it was a very weak link for us in order for us to grow and to succeed. So we recognized that we needed a unified, documented, company-wide approach to managing programs, that, and it had to be adopted in this time frame. So along with critical change scheduling, it became more to us. We had to also develop program plans that started out at the very beginning. A document doesn't have to be a real formal format, but it had to be something that the program team, specifically the program manager, saw as a living document as changes occurred in the program. It had to have system breakdown structures. We're trying to get to some standard approach to how systems are, are interconnected. Work breakdown structures. We've moved to standard work breakdown structures. The critical chain, the schedules, procurement plans, and on and on, so that when we start, and one thing that's missing here is the cost plans, time phase cost plans that are associated and connected to uh, the schedules, the tasks. And these need to start out at the beginning of the program before we get started in any, in any high degree of work. But what about resources in terms of behavior needs? The information on program priorities and resource tasking had to be gathered in a way that we could take action before there was too much, uh, we were in too much trouble. You heard that from, from uh, Bill, you heard it from Steve. We had, to, we had to understand what our information needs were and how to gather them. Material labor demands had to be executed as early as necessary, not right now. And in accordance with task availability reports. This was a new concept for us, waiting on doing things when we were used to doing them right away and in some kind of ad hoc manner. Uh, these had to be prioritized according to highest buffer penetration and synchronized across all the programs. And this was new for us. Resources executing tasks in a relay runner uh, fashion. Are there ways of determining that? Certainly there are, and we're finding that out uh, to give us an indication of how, whether we're improving or not, because there isn't a real definition of what relay runner is and whether you're improving. It turns out there is. When we started these programs out, um, the amount of time from the time a task was posted to the time that people began to post um, uh, work on it. When we started, it was 120 days, which means we had never status programs in this manner before. Uh, the last time we looked at that, we were down to about two weeks. We want to get that to one day. When it's posted, they begin to work on the program. It's a good indicator of what, whether we're doing it in a relay runner fashion mode. The other thing that has to happen in terms of managing the behaviors uh, is that task updating has to be consistent with observed progress. When, you, when we started out, uh, people would say, I know we're ahead of schedule. I know we're not in the same place that this schedule indicates. The easiest thing for me to do, for anybody to do, is walk down on the floor, take the task completion sheet that comes out of the schedules, and say, are these tasks, do they look completed? Is the hardware there? go to a program team review and begin to ask questions about, around tasks that were on the availability report and find out whether people say, yeah, I recognize that and I'm working on it. It was a pretty straightforward process, but if it doesn't get done, in other words, these are the manager, management behaviors, if it doesn't get done, you don't change the organization. Resource managers and program managers have to understand the relationship between task priorities and remaining duration and buffer penetration. And the program managers and the resource managers have to be proactive when tasks are running late. And 
be forward-looking when there are impacts on related tasks. Uh, one of the things that we have learned to do or that came at us as a fact as a problem was, but I've got all these tasks, for particularly a program manager, I've got all these tasks, which one do I need to look at first? And it is a very straightforward process, and we do this every week with the program managers and look at those tasks from the buffer status report that they ought to be concentrating on in order to regain schedule if there is uh, a problem with it. There's also a need for synchronization. How do we immunize our processes and individual projects with conflicting priorities from other programs? We have to stagger the starts of projects in order to have shorter schedules and that the stagger reduces the conflicts with resources. And what we're trying to achieve is a feasible immune schedule that's shorter than critical path scheduling. And here's a typical example of uh, some tasks with some interdependencies. The safety is still there. And there is contention between resource C and resulting in a 56-day schedule. It, when you get rid of the uh, resource contention, you end up with a schedule that's about 72 days. When you remove the safety and you aggregate it and place it into strategic positions for project buffer and feeding buffers, you end up with an even shorter schedule. And we did this modeling over and over and over again for ourselves to convince ourselves, uh, would we get a longer schedule if we, did, if we did left the safety in? And what does it mean relative to removing the safety? And we had to stagger schedules in order to reduce conflicts between resources from program to program to program. And all that means is that you're going to delay some work, but you're going to end up meeting your commitments. Now, there are two, two important derivatives from the synchronization mechanism. The projects will wait to start and resource assignments will be focused on tasks that support staggering of priorities. In other words, we have what's called a task availability report. That will be the priorities that are and are the priorities our resources uh, work to and resource managers. Now we have program directors and program managers have to function in some manner with this priority scheme. And there are control indicators. And we're going to show you a, a, a a film or a video of the program director and program manager talking about how they manage with this system. I'll use TOC uh, to, to uh, support the interaction that I have with resource managers and functional managers uh, by taking what we call our task availability report, call it the TAR. The TAR indicates to me what tasks are available and are being worked within a one week window essentially. Uh, these reports go with me and with my project engineer to all of our uh, program meetings. Uh, we go over these reports and uh, we specifically get uh, information uh, from the resources that are actually working the program to give me the confidence that the, these tasks are in fact being worked and that progress is being made on them. And it gives me sort of like a check uh, to ensure that the, the system is being updated and that the reports and that the data that are represented by the TOC output are valid and current and, and uh, I have confidence in them. So uh, it's sort of, a, sort of a tool that a program manager will use to, to uh, sort of dipstick the, uh, the progress of the functionals and make sure that the progress that's being reported is in fact true. I guess one of the examples uh, that we can give you on how we manage to uh, TOC would be uh, a recent uh, problem that we had. Um, we had the uh, the performance index report uh, showed that the that the uh, the buffer was being penetrated at a, at a, at a rate that was unacceptable. Um, now that's that's the quick quick glance that I use. Uh, in a program, uh, rather than going through a program in depth every week, I just look at two or three reports, and I take a look at one, which is what I call the EKG of the program, or the health of the, of the program, which is performance index report. And the red line, uh, which I call the red line, which is the program buffer status report, uh, was going south on me. So uh, immediately, uh, 
I asked uh, Tom to take a look at the hold-up report. That's right. We looked at the hold-up report, and we found out that there were some tasks, actually, on the critical chain that weren't being worked. And uh, it, was, it was almost real time. We found out that there was some data that we had to have from a customer in order to complete some engineering design and some cabinets. Uh, we found out that the data hadn't arrived yet, and uh, that was the holdup, and that's why the critical chain was being, being uh, held up. And uh, we, uh, we found out that, the, that we got the data, and uh, as soon as we got the information, it got turned around, and uh, you know, we're back up, you know, heading towards the blue side again. Now, in the old days, that would have taken several weeks, as I'm sure many of you have experienced out there as program managers. That would have taken weeks to find that. But here in the turn of one week, we saw that, that uh, the line was going the wrong direction, and we were able to identify the problem and fix it. And it would have taken much longer just to identify the problem before. That's right. In some cases, you'll find that people don't really understand that the criticality of tasks that they're working on, that a particular task might be on the critical chain. And uh, unless it's identified early and uh, worked and uh, a, a management uh, solution applied to it, uh, it could go on for, for quite a long time. And uh, in some cases, if you eat up that critical chain and it's gone, uh, it's very difficult to make it up. Results in a, a schedule slip to you and possible cost implications. What, what I would think that uh, is, is worth considering is that uh, when, when the bid finally gets awarded and uh, you got your program plan established, you got to take the network and the planning that you did in the proposal phase and now you've got to turn it into a program, essentially. So what you've got to do is you've got to take all that information you have, your, your basis of bid, your estimates, and uh, your WBS and your schedules, and you've got to work all that into a TOC network. Um, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, and it takes a lot of iterations. Uh, you don't always get it right the first time. Um, sometimes you don't get it right the second time either. But you find out that the more, the more you work on it, the more visibility you have on it, the more useful it becomes to you. Uh, it becomes more correct, it becomes a reflection of the true nature of the program, and then you can manage with, with some credibility. Uh, you, you can ask people about tasks and what they're doing, and, and you can, you can uh, identify schedule problems, or you can look at the reports that come out of, out of a TOC, and you can get good management tools. So again, you're making a commitment to the customer, and you're, you're representing the company, and you can do it with some confidence that it, it's, it's going to happen you know, the way it's supposed to happen. Now, the upfront planning is painful. There's no question. It has been painful for us as we've implemented TOC. But we've decided that the pain is well worth it. But why is it painful? Well, the reason it's painful is because most companies don't look at the tasks at that in-depth of a level. And now you're forced to basically change your entire culture of your company. And it's a good thing, because never before have we had the in-depth look at a program and be able to see what's really going on in a program throughout its three or four year life. One of the things that you do need in order to get that, that information is, is you need a commitment by everyone in the company, such that as they're working on your program, uh, they, they take the time and the effort to status it, they, uh, they update your network, or they update your program, and it's a, it's a it's a commitment that really has to be bought into by everybody within the company, but particularly with on my particular program. Uh, they've they've got to they've got to do it with rigor and uh, with some discipline. But it's really not hard to do. I mean, it's it's not anything that uh, is a big imposition as far as time or effort is concerned. It's just a matter of keeping it current and providing accurate and timely information. So let's summarize a little bit on, on what we've been talking about and what you've heard. Multi-project management in a TOC environment has these, these components associated with it. Synchronization is key to uh, minimizing the conflict between tasks and between projects. Planning processes have to be in place. Scheduling and budgeting processes. Changes in behavior. In fact, that's the biggest uh, Biggest issue we had to count, encounter. And there has to be a mechanism for reports, for showing and, and, and uh, displaying the information that comes out of the system. So where are we? Well, we're in the institutionalization phase of a new operating paradigm. And we are in continuous improvement at this stage. 
We've had 18 months of meeting uh, scheduled deliveries on time or better. Uh, cycle time reductions of between two and four months, and this is varies between programs, uh, depending on the length and the, and the complexity of the programs. We've had $37 million increase in the number of profitable programs that we're exercising. In other words, we've been able to get through that phase of, of the programs that were difficult and weren't, weren't providing um, profit to us, and we've moved on to the kind of work that we want to do. And we've had a savings of between 5 and 10 percent of revenue. This can improve and will continue to improve, and we now have a measurement for doing that. And it results for us, from where we started from, in about $4 million of savings. We're going to listen to Bill Newell again, and he's going to discuss something that we've already had some reference to, and that is uh, saving a program and winning a customer. When we first implemented TOC, we had one extremely troubled program. Uh, we were within about four months of delivery under contract, and we knew we weren't going to make it. Now, this is good information to share with your customer when you understand this. But when you do it, you better be able to tell them when will you deliver, and you better make that date. We were in trouble on that program with schedule because we did not have our schedules under control. We didn't have a good, robust system that was helping us doing the estimating uh, to dates that we could really meet. Uh, we looked long and hard at this particular program. We had our first rudimentary schedules, as I mentioned, available to us, our first estimated buffer, estimated critical chain duration. We weren't really sure whether or not this was going to be it. But after studying, uh, after bringing our team in, involving all of the people uh, that had to deliver on the program through the structured approach, we made an estimate uh, that it would require an additional nine months to deliver this program. We shared that with our customer. We took our beating. Uh, but then we delivered to that date almost to the very day that we had committed to nine months earlier. Uh, it was not simply that TOC had helped us make a prediction of when that program would be finished, but it allowed us throughout the duration of the program to understand step by step whether or not we needed to bring more resources into that program, whether we needed to change priorities with our other programs, uh, in other words, simply manage the program better in order to meet our new customer commitment. We didn't finish on time by our contract, but by being able to present to our customer a situation that was other than what we desired and making a commitment and hitting that, uh, we won back a lot of the confidence that we otherwise would have lost. So how do we get there? We had to recognize a need for a consistent approach uh, to managing programs. And uh, I can tell you that from my perspective when we started out, I didn't think we'd ever, ever do that. Uh, I've worked in three different companies and uh, I've never seen a consistent approach. It was more like each program doing its own thing. And it had to do with planning, 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 scheduling, and control. Because I've got to have the feedback. I've got to have the control mechanism that tells me what I need to do next. And, as we, and we did this by uh, developing and executing a six-phase implementation plan. And it started with the senior management buy-in, all the senior managers, uh, with Dee here leading the way and uh, me following along. This is the typical six-phase uh, implementation that uh, you go through in order to in order to achieve this uh, get to this point where you can get to continuous improvement with TOC the first phase for us was a network of the implementation and it was constructed with the senior management and by the senior management but there was also a deliverable that came out of that and that was a document that was a summary 
of all the phases that we tracked our progress against, and there were objectives in there where we could, and, and we set up a, pro, a scheme, as a matter of fact, of measurement that said, is this observable yet? Is it not observable? Is it uh, in place? Is it fully functioning? And it gave us an indicator of how we were moving towards the objective we were trying to achieve. Phase two was an announcement. We announced to the organization out in the high bay what we were going to do, uh, what was going to happen, the order at which it was going to happen, and who was going to be involved. Phase three was the initial scheduling of the initial networks and project launches. That was a phase, a, a period in which we built our internal expertise uh, because we wanted to make sure that we had repeatability when the implementation was over, the ability to manage this ourselves and, and create new networks and schedules. But we also had to develop uh, information system expertise also. This, also, this phase also included a buy-in of the project teams. These were two and two and a half day uh, periods where we uh, took them through what critical chain and what scheduling was going to be for both the teams and the resource managers. There were initial networks that were built and synchronized uh, critical chain schedules were, were a result of that. They were primitive compared to the things that we've learned over the past year and a half. However, they were very usable. The first network we built was the Airbus network. And although there were, there were problems associated with it, it did predict the end date for us, and it did predict what we ought to be looking at. The other thing that we did during the implementation is that we had daily meetings. The implementation team had daily meetings to discuss the issues, maintain continuity with each other on what was going on, because the information is evolving, your knowledge is evolving very rapidly, and uh, we needed to determine priorities for that particular day. In phase four, we scheduled the rest of the work that we had already, that was booked. Uh, this was a period of very high learning for us, for the project team. Uh, there was a lot of innovation, a lot of automation that occurred during that time. We did establish generic templates of repetitive processes that we, that, uh, we also documented. And along the way, we were also uh, creating standards and processes for ourselves during the implementation and it was key to maintaining the quality and cycle time for the schedules, for the critical chain schedules. And as the, as the processes and the standards were refined, we experienced tremendous growth in expertise and being able to answer questions. And also during this time is when we refined, developed and refined our reports, how we were going to go about doing analysis and what the presentation formats were. Now there's an interesting thing that happens uh, in our organization, we didn't have anything such as scheduling. And as soon as you see the sea of data, which we've heard before, as soon as you see the sea of data, you go, ooh, how can I, you know, collect it in such a way that it has meaningful information? So what we ended up with, or what we started out with, was a lot more reports than we really needed. Today, we're basically working with four reports, three of which are graphical and one of which is the TAR. Okay, it has all the information that we need. Also during this time, uh, this is where we developed the triggers for decision making. Uh, you saw that signal, that's kind of like an angle of attack indir indicator, as a matter of fact, that red and blue signal. That's the first indicator of whether we are off plan or on plan. And it's really just a relationship. It's a difference between project buffer penetration and critical chain penetration. And it works beautifully, especially for a controls engineer, all I want to do is, is it going in the wrong direction? And then what do I need to do to correct it? And the other level, the, the next level that we look at are, are we're able to pull information out of the schedules and, and plot them in terms of key date indicators. And the program managers use this in order to get an, get an indication of on these key dates, are we uh, within the time frame that we're looking to achieve? The buffer status report tells them what tasks they need to look at, and out of that buffer status report comes what we call an activity or hold-up report, and all it is is a summarization of the tasks 
relative to the number of buffers they're affecting. And of course, the, the task availability report. In phase five, we went to full launch. Uh, we completed basically the technical impl uh, implementation. It provided the new net, the uh, new metrics and the task updating, provided uh, project status and buffer analysis for us. It, reinforcement of the new net, uh, the new metrics was part of our, became part of our employee evaluate, or evaluation process. In other words, we're trying to say to them, these are the things we're going to measure you against in addition to the things we've been working on. It's also a period when chronic problems that you haven't addressed become very apparent. And it's during that period that we use the thinking processes to uh, mitigate the emotional impact of it. <clears throat> 